Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elisa Basselt, and I am the Chief Learning Officer at the Canadian Physiotherapy Association. I will be moderating today's session. Today, we'll be discussing the topic, Navigating COVID-19 Government Subsidies and Programs. You will hear a brief statement from Gowling, WLG, and Welch, LLP on this topic. Following that, I will be asking our representatives some frequently asked questions that we have received from our members over the past several days. We will also be taking questions live from attendees during this webinar. If you have a question, please submit it via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. In addition, we will be recording today's webinar and it will be made available on CPA's channels. Before I introduce our speakers, I would like to acknowledge that while much of the information related to COVID-19 is rapidly changing, that is particularly true of this topic. The CPA's advocacy team has been in active discussions with several federal government ministries to help them understand the complexity of the economic impact on physiotherapists, as well as demonstrate the critical role physiotherapists play in treating patients through physical distancing. We will continue to work diligently to ensure that physiotherapists are supported by these measures, including the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. Earlier today, the Prime Minister announced that modifications to the program will be implemented to ensure that people do not fall through the cracks. We are relieved to hear the government acknowledge that changes are needed. Our advocacy team will continue to champion these modifications and provide the physiotherapy perspective in discussions with the government as they make changes to this benefit. The CPA is actively monitoring the situation and we will share updates on changes as they are announced. With that as background, I would now like to introduce our speakers. Nina Gupta joined us on our March 20th webinar on employment law. We're very pleased to have her join us again to provide an update on recent developments. As a reminder, Nina is a partner in Gowling's Waterloo Region and Toronto offices. Her practice focuses on a broad range of employment and human rights matters. Nina has advised a wide array of employers, from startups to world-renowned multinationals, on all aspects of employment law, including employment policies, offer letters, compensation plans, cross-border employment, and regulatory compliance in Canada. Nina regularly advises employers on both compliance and litigation involving the Ontario Human Rights Code, the Canada Labour Code, the Canadian Human Rights Act, Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, and the Employment Standards Act. When Nina's not working in the office, she's usually helping her teenage son with her favourite four-legged grandson, a 1,300-pound horse shoveling manure and calming the horse down. She says those are great skills for her day job. Thank you, Nina, for joining us today. Mona has been with, El with Welch LLP since 1997. Her public accounting background before then included four years as an auditing and accounting manager and GST specialist, plus an additional eight years at a small local accounting firm. Mona received her CA designation in 1990. In her current role at Welch, Mona provides indirect and payroll tax advice to her clients in various industries. Mona has worked on indirect tax reviews for several national and Ottawa-based not-for-profit organizations, as well as some for-profit organizations. In addition, she has given presentations through various organizations on income tax for the self-employed and financial accounting for small businesses. Mona has also instructed GST and HST courses on behalf of CPA Ontario. Most recently, Mona was designated as the manager of the newly formed COVID-19 Wage Subsidy Centre of Expertise at Welch. Thank you, Mona, for joining us. So I'm going to uh, first turn the session over to Nina. She's going to say a few words about what she's seen since she last spoke with us. We'll then hear from Mona, and then I will open it up to questions. So, Nina. Hi. So uh, I'm hoping that most of the participants who are joining us today um, either had an opportunity to hear the recording. Um, sorry, am I on mute? Can you hear me? We can hear you. You're great. Yeah. Okay, super. Um, so I'm hoping that most of the participants here had an opportunity to either attend um, the session uh, a week and a half ago or um, have had a chance to download it off the CPA website. 
I've got to learn how to do that. But anyway, um, and I just had a very few number of updates from that discussion. And because I really want to hear uh, Mona, because many of the questions that have arisen in my practice have actually been pretty detailed accounting questions as well as legal questions. <coughs> so first thing, there, um, as we discussed uh, very briefly last time, is the business wage subsidy. And you may recall that if we go back a little bit further, the government started with a 10% wage subsidy, payroll cost subsidy for CCPCs that were supposed to be essentially, if you will, a reduction on the remittances that you would otherwise send to government. Now that was very unhelpful for the vast majority of my clients because in, including my own firm would technically not qualify for that because we are not a CCPC, we're a partnership, so it excluded all partnerships. It excluded any companies that were not CCPCs uh, because they were either too big or had a foreign ownership component. And the 10% was considered to be vastly um, too little to actually be of any meaningful help. So the next thing we saw was the business wage subsidy. I know Mona's going to talk about it in great detail. I've had a chance to take a peek at her slides and they're very good. So um, the one thing that I have um, had are a lot of questions from small owner entrepreneurs. And although physiotherapists are really, I think they see themselves first, firstly and rightfully as regulated healthcare professionals, from a business tax and legal perspective, they are also small business owners, many of you. And for those of you that are small business owners, the business wage subsidy may be of significant help to you. Um, and essentially it's a subsidy for first 75% of your payroll costs up to a maximum of 874 a week, which translates into an annualized income for the employee of 58,700. What all of those numbers and alphabet soup works out to is that the businesses for which you work or which you own are effectively supposed to pay you first or pay the in, in, individual employee first and then claim reimbursement. And the government has suggested that they'll be able to get monies in three to six weeks. I think that's very optimistic and I'm telling my clients plan for eight to 10 weeks before you actually see a dime of government money in your bank account. Now, finally, I'm getting a lot of questions of, oh, well, that's really great. Uh, what if I own my own business and pay myself a salary and I hire a couple of maybe, you know, other physiotherapists either on a part-time basis or a full-time basis. And so far the government's been quite understanding of owner operated businesses, um, small businesses, and in fact, the business wage subsidy will be payable for what they call non arm lengths, i.e., owners, directors, um, shareholders of a corporation, provided that the you can show you've been paying a certain amount pre COVID to justify what you're alleging you're paying post COVID. So I think for my, uh, and I don't just do, deal with physiotherapists, I deal with a number of other regulated health professionals. I've had calls from dentists, I've had calls from um, occupational therapists. They're all in a similar boat. Very few of the regulated health professionals are mega corporations. Um, so this business wage subsidy is of real potential assistance. And the reason why I say potential still is because like any lawyer, I like to see the wording of the regulation. And what I've seen is a lot of grandiose um, positivity coming from Minister Morneau and Minister Trudeau and my local rep, um, uh, Minister Bartish Chagger, but I don't have the details. And finally, um, uh, I know that a lot of my small business clients are actually going to their own banks 
to start that process of seeing whether they are eligible for a small business loan. And that process is, sorry, that is my phone, which I had thought I'd silence, but of course not. Um, so one of the things that they have found, there's a couple of things that I've noticed, notwithstanding what the TV says, um, even with the staggered access to CURB, and we can talk a little bit about CURB as my final comment, the government's website is already having technical difficulties beyond their control. So that's number one. Number two, the banks who are supposed to help you with liquidity by providing you small business loans uh, up to 40,000 backstopped by the guarantee with a significant advantage if you prepay it by December 2021, they're also overwhelmed because that, those are the same bank officers that are getting requests for car loan deferrals and mortgage deferrals and, you know, credit card increases. And so um, I have a friend who's a banker who says, not only am I considered to be essential, Nina, I've been told that I'm critical. And I ask them, well, does that mean you get a raise? And the response is, no, I'm not getting a raise. So those are some of the trends that I've seen. The other thing that I've seen, which is quite interesting, is I have seen more layoffs and more sort of across the board pay cuts than I have ever seen in my career. And I practiced for over 30 years. But what's interesting is the plaintiff's bar, so the employee bar, the worker bar, the union bar, has been very... Uh, quiet because I think we're all in shell shock over COVID-19 a little bit and we just want to see where the government and where the courts might be going before we start spending a lot of money on legal fees. Um, Elisa, I don't know if that's of help to your people. That's really all I wanted to say. If, if um, you know, I really know that uh, Mona is the uh, I said in our prep call that I was the hors d'oeuvre and Mona was the main course and everybody wants the main course. So I'm just going to stop now. And if there are questions that I can jump in on, I propose to jump in on them later. But I don't know if, Elisa, that's what you wanted from me. Yeah, that is, that's perfect. I think it was really helpful just to um, hear a little bit about how things are changing, some of the changes that you've seen, obviously, in the, the last couple of weeks. Um, and I, I think that that was very helpful. Um, I am going to turn it over to Mona um, uh, to provide a, a different perspective sort of from an accounting lens. Um, she does have a deck. Allison's going to pull the deck up so that we can see the presentation while Mo Mona yeah. walks us through yeah. it. Um, and then we'll get into uh, questions. Great. Thank you, Lisa. And I want to thank uh, the CPA for inviting me to speak to you today. And I'll be talking about some of the myriad government programs that have been created to help businesses get through this COVID-19 pandemic. So, um, Alison, if you can please uh, go to the next slide. Great. Uh, so, the, you know, the programs have been coming out fast and furious, and it's kind of difficult to keep up with them all. Uh, and I'll be speaking about the programs listed below. So I'll start out with the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, or CERB, or CURB, or however it's being pronounced, uh, which I think may be relevant for some of the people attending today. I'll also be talking about the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy. So there, there are actually two different wage subsidies that have been introduced recently, and each of them have different eligibility requirements. So I'll be providing details about both the 10% subsidy and the 75% subsidy. And then we also have something called the Canada Emergency Business Account. And this is a special interest-free loan benefit that's been created to help small businesses and not-for-profits cover their current operating expenses. And then I'll also be talking about the federal government tax deferral program and some provincial measures and all of this within a time frame of 10 minutes. So uh, please get to the next slide. Oh, you already, yeah, okay, great. So, so here we're talking about the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. And uh, this program is available for employees, 
contract workers, self-employed individuals, and it even covers people who would not otherwise be eligible for the employment insurance or EI. Next slide, please. So to qualify, uh, you have to be a Canadian resident and you have to be at least 15 years old and you have to have had income of at least $5,000 in the 12 months preceding the date of your application. And that income had to have been from one or more of the following sources, uh, income, um, employment income, self-employed income or EI parental benefits. Next slide, please. So you can apply uh, in respect of income related to any four week period beginning March 15th through to October 3rd. And as well, in order to qualify, you have to be or expect to be without employment or self-employment income for at least 14 consecutive days in the initial four week period. So for example, let's say you stopped work on March 10th, for a reason related to COVID-19, and you don't expect to work again for at least the next two weeks, you would qualify for the benefit. And keep in mind that uh, if you stop working voluntarily, you don't qualify for the benefit, and you have to reapply for the benefit every four week period. Next slide, please. So the benefit is equal to $2,000 per four week period for up to four Four week period. So in other words, the program goes for 16 weeks. The benefit is taxable and you can apply for the benefit starting today. Um, so if you go to that link that I've provided at the bottom of the screen, um, uh, you'll, you'll need to, um, you'll need to apply depending on your month of birth. So for example, if you were born in January, February, or March, you can call today. But uh, if you were born in April, May, or June, you have to wait till tomorrow. So the schedule is all posted on that link. Next slide, please. Uh, next, we'll cover the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy. Next slide, please. So first, we're going to look at the 10% subsidy. And uh, this subsidy is for wages that were or will be paid between March 18th and June 19th, 2020. And the maximum subsidy is $1,375 per employee and $25,000 per employer. And the subsidy is available immediately. And the way to claim it is by reducing employer income tax remittances withheld from employees on their pays. And keep in mind that you can only reduce the remittances to CRA by the amount of income tax withheld. So you still need to remit any CPP or EI withheld, and you would need to remit the employer portion of the CPP and EI as well. And this subsidy is also taxable. Next slide, please. So in order to be eligible for this subsidy, um, you have to, the employer has to already have an employer remittance account with CRA and the employer has to be either one of the following. So they have to be either a Canadian controlled private corporation or CCPC for short. And then if they are a CCPC and they have, they have to have a business limit that is greater than nil. So this would be applicable for CCPCs that are associated with other companies. And then uh, the employer can also be an individual or can be a partnership, actually. And, um, but uh, they can, the partnerships would only qualify if all the partners are eligible employers. So the partnership would have to be made up of individuals and CCPCs or other partners as listed on the slide. And then NPOs and charities also qualify for the subsidy. Next slide, please. So I created a numerical example, but I don't have time to cover it. But if people ask during the question period, I can go over it at that time. But you'll have this for your reference. Next slide, please. Uh, so now I'll go over the 75% subsidy. And so you can see the list of eligible employers is much more extensive for the 75% subsidy than it is for the 10% subsidy. So the 75% subsidy is meant to benefit all Canadian employers, large and small, uh, other than public bodies like municipalities and crown corporations, for example. And the eligibility for the subsidy is based on the employer's sales level. So if there's been at least a 30% decline in gross revenue measured against the same period last year, the employer will qualify for the subsidy. Um, next slide, please. 
so for example, if you look at this table on the slide, you'll see that if your revenues for March 2020 are 30% less than your revenues for March 2019, you'll be eligible for the subsidy in respect of the wages that you paid during the period of March 15th to April 11th. And then employers are going to need to reapply for the subsidy each month and they'll have to attest to the decline in revenue. So the maximum benefit is equal to $847 per week per employee and is calculated in reference to the employee's pre-crisis remuneration. And the maximum wage for which an employer will be subsidized is 75% of 58,700. So if you take 75% of 58,700 and divide it by 52 weeks, you'll get the 847 per week. I don't know how to turn off my phone, obviously. So pardon me. <laughs> um, it'll stop ringing in a minute, I'm sure. <laughs> So employers are expected to make their best efforts to top up employee salaries to bring them to pre-crisis levels. And the funds from the subsidy are expected to be available within the next six weeks. And the CRA portal, which is gonna be used to claim the subsidy is expected to be available within the next three weeks. And the subsidy is taxable for employers. Now, if you make the claim under the 10% wage subsidy, this is going to reduce the claims available under the 75% subsidy. And then also, if you've got an employee who's eligible for the CERB, in other words, they stopped working, you would not be eligible to claim the subsidy for the remuneration paid to an employee in a week that falls within a four week period for which the employee is eligible for the CERB. So in other words, let's say you've got an employee who stopped working on March 15th, the employer could not claim a wage subsidy in respect of that employee throughout the four week period ending on April 11th. Next slide, please. Uh, so I'll just touch briefly on the Canada Emergency Business Account. Next slide, please. Uh, so this account provides for interest-free loans up to $40,000 in order to help small businesses and not-for-profit organizations cover their current operating expenses. So in order to be eligible, the applicant must be able to show that they paid between $50,000 and a million dollars in total payroll in 2019. And if the loan is paid off by December 31st, 2020, 22, 25% of the loan balance will be forgiven. So for further information, uh, interested parties are being advised to contact their financial institutions and the program is expected to be available in early April. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm just going to quickly go over some other measures. Next slide, please. Uh, so the federal government has provided tax deferrals for any income taxes owing between March 18th and August 31st. So these payments can now be deferred until August 31st and no interest and penalties will accrue during the deferral period. Um, HST and GST remittances are also deferred, but most of today's audience likely doesn't collect GST and HST, uh, as well as custom duties and sales taxes. So next slide, please. Um, the, the provinces have also come out with some measures. Uh, here's a list of Ontario's measures. I won't go into it in the interest of time. And then on the next slide, uh, if you go to the next slide, please, I've provided a link to other provincial government sites where you can obtain information about their COVID-19 related programs. So that's what I've got for presentation. Thank you so much. Okay, so that's wonderful, Mona. Really appreciate that. Um, so we do have a number of questions. Um, I'm going to uh, read the question and, and have uh, Mona or Nina answer it, uh, depending on uh, whose expertise. So the first question, are self-employed individuals who are independent contractors who do not own their own business or clinic eligible for any other government funding sources other than CERB? Uh, so can you repeat the question, please? Yes. Uh, are self-employed individuals who are independent contractors who don't own their own clinics, um, are they eligible for any other government funding sources other than CERB? Not that I can think of. How about you, Nina? Would be... 
Um, if you're self-employed, uh, first of all, like all citizens, uh, you are eligible for the deferral of income tax. And that's a huge thing because it's really cash flow. And cash flow is king these days. Um, and also, you know, the GST doesn't usually apply to the regulated health professionals because, to the best of my recollection, they're, you're not collecting GST or HST. So that is one thing that you might want to uh, look at. Um, um, I don't know, um, Mona, maybe you can add, address this. I can't think about, you know, the um, small business loan. I don't think that they actually qualify if they're like essentially uh, individual right. self-employed. Yeah, they, they would have had to have paid payroll, which they wouldn't yeah. have. It's all derived over that payroll. And I've had a long issue with people, quite frankly, calling themselves independent contractors because you know they don't have necessarily the same protections that employees are given. And, mm -hmm. and we are seeing the huge difference between how employees are being taken care of in this economic crisis. And everybody's talking about workers and employees because they have organized groups. Well, the self-employed professionals in the gig economy are not being helped that much. So um, I, aside from the ability to defer taxes, um, I'm not aware of any help in those situations. Now, more, we are being told by the government that programs are changing as we speak, mm -hmm. that, uh, that the criteria for things like CURB are changing as we speak. Um, and I actually encourage you to take this to the CPA, but also to the Canadian Federation of Small Business, and I don't belong to them, but any advocacy group that's appropriate, you should be writing, you should be writing to your CBC, because unless you scream, you're not going to be heard right now. Okay, so we're also getting, there's a, there was a number of questions around, around that. We're also getting questions around the 30% um and how do you how how do you establish the 30 percent drop mm -hmm. um as well as what if for example you're a new business right so the um we're still waiting for legislation on details on how to calculate the 30 percent basically all we have all the guidance we have right now is just to use your normal accounting method to determine whether your revenues have declined um, and then for new businesses as well, uh, the question did come up, what about new businesses? Well, maybe the answer was maybe you can compare your revenues to your previous months. If you don't have a previous year to compare it to. But again, uh, we're hoping to get some clarification in the legislation for that. Okay. Thank you. Um, Nina, perhaps this question can be directed at you. Uh, from a legal standpoint, what type of contracts should business owners be using for the um, Canada Emergency Wage, wage Subsidy Hiring, regarding hiring? I'm not sure, uh, it, it, uh, I'm not sure what, what you mean by contracts, because contracts are typically given at the uh, beginning of employment. You're going to work for me, and you're going to work for me on these terms, whether it's a split mm -hmm. of the billings or whatever. And now I can't pay you, so I'm going to apply or I'm having economic issues, I'm gonna apply for the business wage subsidy. If the issue is you're trying to get the employee not to sue you for not paying you 100% of what they used to get paid for, probably you need to go to your own lawyer and they need to work out what works for you. So typically I have that question asked about, well, I can't afford to top off or I can only go up to the 58,700, but I can't, my people are earning 65k and we look at each situation and we actually draft up a little agreement and i tell everybody honestly i don't know how the courts are going to view that agreement we're all trying to act in good faith in very difficult times uh, but there's no guarantee that uh, the courts 6 12 18 months from now aren't going to say something unexpected Thank you. Um, a couple of questions here around uh, sort of along the, the lines of if we make income even a little through uh, some type of working for the duration of the CERB coverage, will that make us ineligible? Yeah, so based on the legislation right now, it would make you ineligible, but uh, the 
Prime Minister has come out and said that they're going to be looking at situations where people are just working a small amount and how they can be protected going forward. So we're looking to, uh, to get an update on that within the next days, I guess. Yes, and I noticed, uh, Elisa, there's a lot of, you know, people who um, are asking questions. I don't know if you intend to do this live, but it's the one that I get asked and I don't know the answer to. So now that I have Moan on the line, I'm going to ask it. So um, a couple of the physiotherapists online have said, look, um, I've had a catastrophic loss in, in actual bookings and work that I'm doing today. But, you know, some of my insurance companies or telehealth or whatever is really slow in paying. So I have dribs and drabs of com income coming in mm -hmm. that is, um, you know, maybe attributable to January or February or pre-COVID era. How does that money trickling in afterwards, how is that dealt with in terms of trying to prove that 30% loss in income or even being eligible for CERB? Right, so uh, we're getting a lot of those questions as well. Um, and it, so if you're, I guess it depends on how you're, if it's income from self-employment, you know, you're, you've, you, uh, for accounting purposes, you would use the accrual method for determining your income, right? So uh, it would be based on when was the income actually earned versus when it was actually paid. So if you, invoice for something three months ago and you're not, and you're just receiving the payment now, that's not considered today's income, that's considered three months ago income. Uh, so that would be one thing to consider. And then uh, with respect to um, just little drips and drabs of income, well, it looks like the prime minister is gonna be addressing that issue. So hopefully we'll have uh, some remedy for that. Uh, and then when it comes to the 30%, again, we're still waiting for legislation. So uh, you're supposed to be using regular accounting methods for determining your your revenues. So that's all we have right now. Does that answer your question somewhat? Yes, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, there's another question here um, about any issue with switching from contractor to employee status um, to qualify for the wage subsidy. I'm going to answer that. I think it's problematic. I, uh, and the reason why it's clearly looking at the words that are used are wages. And um, one of the things that if you listen to the prime minister, it really talks about employees and wages and workers. Um, I would like to see the CPA along with all of the federations for business say that should include contractors. I don't think if you sort of uh, have like no payroll or very little payroll before. And then all of a sudden you hire people as employees, quote unquote, and they really haven't changed anything. And you claim the subsidy. I think that you would get caught on sort of a general anti-abuse provision uh, or a gen general bad, what is it? Gen it's not a general. Yeah, exactly. Bad actor, not a generally accepted, um, you know, accounting principle. So what what I'm encouraging people because we're, you know, our profession's facing this issue too. In a lot of the smaller law firms, it's done as independent contractors and on a fee split basis. Um, I think you really need to pressure the government because the government has signaled. And actually, go and talk to your opposition members too. I mean, because the the all of these people have signaled, we know we're trying to develop programs in a week that normally take 12 to 24 months. So if we've missed something, rest assured we're trying to work on it, but you have to feed that information back. Um, but I don't think that it's a lovely trick, but I think the trick will get caught. So don't do it. <laughs> um, so there, there are a lot of questions here. So I'm, I'm gonna uh, maybe go for a couple of more. Um, so this question, um, is with regards to CERB specifically, uh, I'm unsure of whether the criteria requires 14 consecutive days without employment and income, or if it's 14 days without employment or income. It's without employment and income. Perfect. Um, so I'm gonna look for a couple more questions. So 
So with regard to CERB, Mona, you mentioned that employees cannot voluntarily stop working to qualify. Um, could providing telehealth service be considered, considered mandatory work? So we've talked about telehealth um, and earnings, but around sort of voluntary versus mandatory and what some of the distinctions are there. Yeah, so I think uh, what they probably had in mind when they made that legislation was they were looking, thinking people like that were self-employed and then they just stopped working so that they could collect the CERB. Um, uh, I think if you have the opportunity to work and you're turning down work because you, in, in order to collect the CRDB, that's what this uh, clause is trying to capture. And also, yeah, and it's also, having said that, um, you know, there's people who can't work for legitimate reasons. Uh, they have elder care responsibilities and child care mm. responsibilities. By the time they pay a babysitter, um, because uh, you know, I, my, my child is 18, so I can tell him to get lost and it's usually not dangerous, but if you have a two-year-old, don't try doing that. So there may be legitimate reasons and then that's a code N and you may be able to essentially say the reason you're not working is you have a legitimate reason. And so you may qualify there. Um, uh, the other question I wanted to talk about um, is, um, uh, the, this is, um, you know, people are asking about, well, look, I can't qualify for that 30% drop if you just look for March, right? Because I had maybe really good two weeks in the beginning of March. And then, of course, the bottom dropped off after we were closed. Mm -hmm. um, at this point in time, the government's been clear, and it's, I think it's stupid, but that's okay. What I think doesn't matter, they're saying March 2020 to March 2019. It's not March 15th to the 31st versus March 15th to the 31st. And it's profoundly unfair to some of my, um, you know, clients who, quite frankly, would qualify for that 30% um, range. Is that your understanding too, Mona, that it's a month-to-month -month comparison? Yeah, it seems pretty clear that's what the intention is, month to month. Now, maybe once they start writing the legislation, they might give us a little bit more uh, nuance so that we can have some latitude. But right now, that's what it's looking like, month to month. So we're getting, uh, this is a really good question, Elisa, too, about we, we were, uh, somebody is pairing, and I think they've given me a hypothetical, we'll, we'll call her Sarah. Um, four to six thousand pre-pandemic. We closed for two weeks, and now we're going to operate with telehealth. But who knows what the revenues are? And of course, we still have, you know, uh, insurance and tax and rent to pay. Uh, what would this What would this wage subsidy be? Now, remember, the wage subsidy is only paid based on what you have paid for that period to the employee, right? So you have really what the government is saying is we will help subsidize your payroll if you front it for us for six to eight or if you're a pessimist like me, 10 weeks. So I wouldn't look at your telehealth revenue per se because what the government is really trying to do is have you try to keep that payment more than necessarily you would just get from telehealth billing. So, you know, we can do more details later on, but that's a lot, a lot of the questions I'm getting. I don't have work to just, like I'm close, I have no work, what should I do? And then the question is, well, what can you afford to front them from your savings, your bank accounts, or line of credit? Um, and in many cases, I have employers who justifiably say to me, Nina, I'm not gonna take a salary, I'm the owner. And I can't afford to top up because by the time I pay for things like insurance and no one's giving up insurance and nobody wants to give up benefits and you've gotten, you know, all these taxes to pay, I can't afford to do the 25% top up. I don't know if you're seeing those kinds of conversations, Mona. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, yeah. I, well, they, you know, the the communication from the government is is that employers are expected to make their best efforts to top up their employees' wages. But if they're not able to do it, well, as long as they 
they could show that they made their best efforts. That's really all that's that's expected. It's not a requirement that they have to top up their the wages, just that they they're expected to make their best efforts. Thank you. Um, I, I, I am going to um, wrap things up in the next couple of minutes. Um, I, but I was before I do that, Mona or Nina, is there anything um, that you would like to kind of say in conclusion? Well, do you want to go? Oh, I guess I'll go. Uh, yeah, well, in conclusion, things are changing rapidly. So, uh, you know, it's important to, to keep optimistic and, and uh, keep looking for more information because it's coming daily. Yeah, so here's a couple of things I think are, are um, just tips. Uh, we don't know what the beginning or the end of all these programs are going to be. So I think it's really important that a couple of things. One is you try to get your records together. I'm convinced we're going to see even more changes on the business wage subsidy. Number two, if you don't already have it, it's really important to open up your digital online My Service Canada account. That's what I'm going to do after this, uh, uh, this uh, session for me. Uh, because it's clear we're not going to be able to talk to a human being when they have, I don't know, what, $1.2 million and 1.2 million EI claims to get through. Um, and, uh, and finally, um, uh, just uh, work, if there are concerns, work through the CPA, work through your um, MP, work through this Canadian Federation of Small Business and your local media to make sure the government knows that uh, there are legitimate concerns about the gaps in these programs. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, so I'm going to bring the session to a close. If there are any other questions, um, please don't hesitate to contact the CPA at information at physiotherapy.ca. Um, Please continue to check out the CPA's COVID-19 resource page. Um, uh, it's at uh, physiotherapy.ca slash COVID-19 for the latest information and updates and other relevant on, on the, what we've talked about and other relevant me me measures as they become available. Um, we also have a section that um, is dedicated to helping members uh, be aware of some of the new supports the government um, is providing to Canadians. Um, and we are continuing to we recognize some of these challenges that you're facing and, and our advocacy team is continuing to work um, to have those conversations uh, moving forward. I would like to just take this final moment to say uh, uh, thank you very much to both Nina and Mona for their time and their expertise today. It's very much appreciated. Uh, thank you for the attendees and the questions um, that came through. I hope you found that valuable um, and can make use of some of this information. Have a good afternoon.